uh, somehow. Ah, okay. If I can somehow um, bring up my uh, agenda page, let me see how that's going to be managed. Here's share screen. And if I can. Okay, there you go. Now, can you see the screen? Yes, Johnny. Okay, is that better? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, it's a challenge because uh, I have two screens and uh, when this happens, it take away my other screen. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to get started on the agenda and then I'm going to uh, uh, default back to a different format. The There's two important uh, subjects I would like to cover. The first is to introduce uh, our new co-lead, Dr. Marilina Pavel. Um, I'll get to that. This is the agenda section. so. Um, I'll follow that with a little bit more uh, discussion on that topic. Uh, it's a, it's a exciting to have uh, Dr. Povell willing to be a co-lead. Um, now, the second part of obviously uh, our, our guest speaker uh, is Antonio, and we'll go by Tony uh, Lacord. He's a director of External Affairs, Textron E Aviation. I think we all pay a lot of attention to this uh, Textron e-aviation. So, okay, what are you guys doing? You know, where are you going? You know, what are you going to do with all this um, uh, acquisition and the new development and the, uh, you know, what happened to the original uh, uh, Nexus uh, eVTO uh, that we're all familiar with? So it's going to be exciting. Uh, and the topic will be leveraging a broad, sustainable aviation portfolio to enable emerging eVTOL use cases. Uh, and Tony has extensive background in this field and broader aviation uh, field. So uh, let me first uh, get back to a different screen and the so that I can Put out the proper page on my screen so I can see. This is a uh, challenging uh, technology challenges uh, <laughs> for me. <laughs> okay, so now let me just say a few words about uh, Dr. Pavel. Um, I think most of you guys and me has uh, the opportunity had the opportunity to work with Dr. Pavel. The last many many years on the uh, transformative vertical flight working group. Um, she's not only well, Dr. Pravel uh, is a, an associate professor with the Department of Control and Operations at facility uh, faculty uh, of uh, aerospace engineering, uh, Delft University of Technology in Netherlands. Uh, I think most of us know the reputation of that of Delft. Uh, uh, it's just uh, one of the top leading uh, university in this field, and she's uh, you now she got a PhD degree from Delft, uh, and presently uh, Marilina is teaching course on helicopter flight dynamics, flight simulation, and control. Uh, Metatronic and design, uh, both online and uh, on site. Um, her technical aircraft technology background is extensive. And I think the main reason that uh, I think she's the perfect person to be the co lead is uh, I think most of us have seen how engaged she is on the transformative verify working groups. And the uh, not only one working group, she's engaged heavily on all three working groups. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, not so much the, the second and the third, not so it, much. It's just amazing, <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, just 
I'll take for example, uh, if you know we are uh, very proud of the uh, working group for the white paper that we publish as a NASA uh, white paper, but I have to tell you, if not for Dr. Povell, that will, white paper would not have happened. Uh, her engagement, her contribution, not only in the content but organization, and you know, we always say you know, with some it's many top level contributors getting everybody working together it's a major major challenge and Dr. Bovell were able to get everybody on the same wavelength and consolidate the different uh, writing style in, and including the editors and contributors uh, from NASA and so on and all our uh, key contributors uh, and reviewers uh, in order to put it all together become a uh, good paper, a good report. Uh, that's just one example. So, and also uh, moving the transformative working group forward, I think uh, we have a lot of potential topic coverage. And one of the important aspects, I think, is going to be that we like to take it even further, more global, more international, because this is the global industry and global uh, advancement. And uh, having Dr. Pavel uh, sitting in Netherlands with a great access to a uh, broader uh, spectrum and uh, subject matter experts and so on, I think that's going to further enhance our ability and the progress uh, that we can make with the TVS4. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Pavel. Thank you so much. And uh, now you just uh signed your life away <laughs> to be the coach. <laughs> we really appreciate that thank you so much. Um, thank you thank you johnny so i'm i'm always i've been excited of working in this group and and you know public services are so important and i was looking mm, through all these years i mean i'm in tv i think from 2015 I, i'm in this group and and yep. if I look, we were always discussing, Johnny, all the fires that were in California. And this year you have them in Europe, Spain and others. So I think this really is for kind of international effort. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward uh, working further uh, with you all. And um, yeah, it has, thank you, Johnny, for taking me on board because it has been always a pleasure. <laughs> to to come in the evening once per month and, and be here <laughs> with you uh, so i i hope that we we can uh, work on a second um, white paper showing um, the new challenges that we have at the moment for the future and um, yeah hopefully we can uh, introduce uh, in the public services um, soon good deal all right hey Thank you. Uh, okay, now the uh, uh, let's uh, uh, you know so much. I uh, uh, appreciate Tony were able to uh, join us today as our guest speaker. Uh, Tony uh, Lacourt is uh, he, again he's a director of external affairs at E Aviation, uh, which is a Textron uh, company, um, and. This e-aviation is a textron initiative to develop new opportunity, uh, new opportunities, leveraging its fixed wing and rotor expertise in emerging sustainable aviation technologies. In his role, in this role, Tony oversees regulatory, uh, regulatory policy and all external customer-facing segments, supporting the development and productionization which is a critically important thing, of e-aviation's electric airplane and e veto offerings. He is respons responsible for building strategic partnership and creating a path for the further development and utilization of aircraft electrification and connected mobility technologies in the global market. Well, Tony uh, was previously a leader within Textron's Bell helicopter in Innovation Division, uh, where he led the commercialization strategy, certification, and integration effort of Bell's emerging veto product lines. And of course, he has a long, successful career uh, with the US Air Force before that, and 
uh, long list of accomplishments uh, in, in the background. So anybody, I think everybody should uh, look him up uh, to uh, read about his uh, career accomplishments. But today I'm going to stop here because I want to leave Tony as much time as we can to talk about what they're working on, which direction, and leave a little time at the end. Hopefully we can ask some questions. Tony, the floor okay. is yours. Thank you, Johnny, for that. Uh, you know, it, it always humbles me to hear an intro when somebody else gives it. Um, I don't I don't normally do that much on myself, so I, I appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity to this team for uh, allow me to present e-aviation and what we're doing in this uh, sustainable aviation space today. So like Johnny, I'm going to try and overcome the, um, I would need to share screen, Johnny. So if you could just I pause for a moment. I'm to, uh, to allow you. So I haven't, I'm looking for the command, <laughs> the button so I can, I can do that. So so while Johnny's doing that, I'll just kind of touch on what I'll cover today. Um, basically, who e aviation is, you know, what our charter is, what our background is, and, you know, how we see things going forward in the future for sustainable aviation. Um, talk about our approach to sustainability, but more importantly, the product line, which I think differentiates us between a lot of the other eVTOL manufacturers today. Uh, we, we like to say we have a family of systems. And then thirdly, discuss our EV tall product lines, um, specifically with regards to um, cargo and air taxi. So with that, let's see. Uh, yeah, you can share yours now. And can you see the slide deck? Um, no? Yes. Yes? Uh, I can see that. Okay, great. All right, so uh, a, a little under two years ago, um, like everybody else, there was this uh, push to go sustainable and how are we going to do it? And one of the things that, uh, you know, from pressure from, you know, the board and the shareholders, as well as the global position with regards to sustainability and aviation, we felt that there was a real need to, to take it seriously, of course, but more importantly, to dedicate resources to that within the company outside of the respective business units. Um, that already existed. So for the first time, uh, Textron stood up a new business unit. So now there's six uh, in this one called Textron E-Aviation, whose dedicated and specific focus is on sustainable aviation. Now, that doesn't take away from the other elements like Bell or Textron Aviation or Systems from doing sustainable projects, but for the most part, anything that's uh, centered on aviation and the future of that aviation flows through this Textron E-Aviation um, business unit. So interestingly enough, you know, uh, was the first time we didn't acquire a company, Cessna, Hawker, Beechcraft, Bell, they were all acquisitions. Uh, one of the first things we did as e-aviation is we went out and acquired a company. <laughs> so we stayed true to form and we acquired Pipistrol over in Ida's China, Slovenia. Um, we did this for the sole purpose of how well they integrated into our vision and our strategy for sustainable aviation. If you think back, Cessna is a pioneer in not only aviation, but in aviation training and how to shape how aviation looks from a uh, U.S. national airspace, but more importantly, a global airspace perspective. So we thought, why not do a family of systems? Uh, start with the electric LSA. So as you know, the Pipistrel Bellis Electro is the first and only certified um, electric uh, airplane in the world. And we are and taking that are and giving people that. exposure to this technology up front um, to entice, you know, new pilots, new maintainers to come into this market because it's new and invigorating technology. But more importantly, we leverage that technology to go forward and carry it into other product lines, which I'll get into. There's, so there's two elements of aviation, the Pipistrel element, as well as the Nexus brand, which is here in Wichita, Kansas. And they're focused solely on the Nexus eVTOL. And I know Johnny mentioned earlier what happened to the Bell Nexus uh, ducted rotor system. And what you see on your screen now is the new um, design. Uh, I would say it went through about seven to eight iterations before we landed on this. And a lot of uh, you know, rigor went into this design and this evolution because of the certification pedigree that we have. Right now, um, there's about 370 total current employees between the Nexus team and the Pipistrel team, and we're projected to grow to about 500 by 2025. And I think it's actually going to arrive sooner than that. 
Um, our charter, uh, our goals, if you will, were a little bit different than most companies. And if you've ever been in a big aviation company, you know that the process burden kind of tends to slow things down. Uh, we needed to be more agile. We, we admit that, you know, we're probably a little bit slow to the market with some of the other manufacturers that are out there and maybe in the lead right now. But we feel we can catch up uh, just because of who we are and what we've done in the past. So one of the things that we wanted to do is do things differently. And so how do we do that? Um, if you looked within all those business units in Textron, you see Bell is a separate organization. Textron Aviation is a separate organization. Now E-Aviation is a separate organization. And in the past, those organizations would have been siloed and do their projects solely in their own little silo. What we've done is been able to take and reach out and grab Bell engineers, grab Textron Aviation engineers, because these aircraft are not just a fixed wing or a rotorcraft. They're uh, an amalgamate of, of both. And even then, some UAS involved as well. So we even use our Textron Systems Division to uh, kind of help out with some of these things about autonomy or actually operating as an uncrewed uh, vehicle. So we actually bring those engineers here. They're not just uh, on a Teams meeting. They're actually sitting here co-designing and developing one with the other teams in Slovenia or in Wichita, Kansas. The other thing is how do we do them as cost effectively as possible? And that's the hard part. We got to get past the process paradigm, uh, as we call it. And if you know uh, anything about design and, and for aircraft, you know that people come up with a list of requirements and send those out to you know the respective suppliers. Uh, we we didn't do that. We brought suppliers or potential suppliers in, interviewed them, and said, "Hey, to be a part of this team, you'd have to sit in here with us and co-design and develop, just like our engineers are doing from across the enterprise." And so that was a different approach. Usually, you know, there's a lot of legal ramifications to that, and you know, we found a way to get over that. But it's actually increased the efficiency and the effectiveness of the team instead of having to go back and forth all the time with the supplier to manage or modify requirements. And the third thing is, you know. How do we create partnerships to make the business work? Um, one of the things I see is there's a lot of new novel technologies out there and companies that are, are spinning up from the ground, maybe not traditionally in the aviation mindset, but that's a good thing. And it's also a bad thing if you're an aviation minded company, right? So what we do is try and delineate between and adjudicate those companies so that they fit in with our culture, our business model, and you know our design uh, requirements and we bring them in here as well and, and sit down and talk about how the partnership goes. Um, can't talk about any of those partnerships today. Um, I would just say that formal agreements are still in work and you would probably see some announcements on those coming forward, but it shouldn't be any surprise the pedigree of these individuals being aviation minded like we are. So I won't go too much into this slide with a pip patrol acquisition, but one of the things that uh, I would just say is pip patrol has been around for quite some time. They started in the glider world, power glider, grew up in through the LSA. Uh, one of the things we'll mention is that they have flown a hybrid aircraft, a four seat high performance hybrid uh, underneath the EU MAHEPA program. And then they're also working on a cargo EV tall uh, platform. One of the things that's unique about this is that there's employees both in Slovenia as well as Italy. So a lot of manufacturing that uh, you know, Pipistrol does is in uh, Gorica, Italy in their factory there. And we just hosted an open house. You can see that online on social media right now. And it was, it was amazing because for the first time ever, they opened their doors and a lot of the, the, the folks within the towns nearby um, didn't know what Pipistrol was and what they did. They didn't know they manufactured airplanes inside. So we had over, uh, we had 1,012 people attend that. But one of the things that, you know, we tried to educate Pipstra on is that social engagement, community engagement is an important piece of this. And we'll talk about that later on with the eVTOL piece, because I think it's one of the things that's going to drive us forward in this space. Um, so far to date, about uh, now we're at about 2,750 aircraft uh, made in the uh, Pipstra product family. Hey, Tony. Yes. Um, Go ahead. In the presenter screen, uh, is it possible you can click on the uh, presentation mode so the screen will be? Yeah, I'm sorry. Off. Let me see. I'm I'm challenged ch challenged at this too, I guess. Um, yeah, I would never know which button to push to make it work. <laughs> did, did that change it or? Uh, we see difference, but this on the right hand lower corner. Yeah, right there, there's a presentation mode that might give you the full screen. Try I have that. the full screen on my other. 
Mm. Yeah. So it could be just the screen, the difference in the screen you're sharing. Yeah. Let's see, I think there's a, I have to go up here and I can't grab. Oh but down below on the, on the bottom of the slide, display settings. Yeah. Okay. And all I've got is optimized for compatibility. <laughs> and that's restart required. So I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to do that. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, it's fine the, the way it was. So, okay. Yeah. So um, what do you see now? You see the title slide? Yeah, we see a title slide. Um, let me go to this. I My apologies. Oh, no problem. Uh, Is that better if I do this? Looks good to me. Okay, okay. Um, so the first product, as I mentioned, was, you know, the electric LSA that's certified. Um, one of the things we look at here is this is a way to get individuals interested and excited about joining aviation from a pilot and a, and a maintenance perspective. But more importantly, the technologies that are powering this aircraft, the battery and the electric motor, are being utilized in other platforms like the NUVA V300 eVTOL uh, cargo platform. Um, what we've learned in these aircraft technologies here are also being transferred over in the Nexus, but at a much larger scale, of course. Uh, about 200 of the Velas' electros now, and just for anybody that's going to Oshkosh uh, next week, uh, we have donated a Velas Electro for auction for the Young Eagles Club. So if you're interested. <laughs> Um, the next is the high performance four seat Panthera. Um, of course, this is a Lycoming I 540. It's not sustainable as it stands right now, but this is, as I mentioned, flown as a hybrid underneath the MAHEPA program. And we have it on our, um, our program chart that once this is certified in the next year or so underneath CS23 and EASA, that we actually go fully electric with this vehicle. So there's an intent to make this a fully electric aircraft. Next would be the Surveyor, uh, which is an ISR platform, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. Uh, right now it's got about a 30 hour endurance. We're working to do uh, work with the government to give that a 60 hour endurance. Um, it's an obsolete pilot vehicle as well. Uh, can be used for cargo or ISR as we mentioned. And you notice all of these technologies in most of the airframes look the same and it's a carryover from the glider roll. So from the tail boom to the actually long wings with the sweep, um, most of these aircraft, you know, they have like a 15 one to glide ratio. So, so next we talk about this, this beast here. This is the Nuba B300 cargo platform. Uh, I just returned from Slovenia uh, this weekend where I actually went over and looked at the assembly of this vehicle. Um, it is almost done. We have intent to fly this in November of this year and then bring a copy of it to the U.S. to do U.S. integration with detect and avoid capability as well as building a corridor from Kansas to North Texas. Um, we'll get more into the use cases of this, but it's probably, uh, I've been in the UAS game for quite a while, and this thing is 3,000 pounds. It's got about a 45-foot wingspan on the upper aft wing, and it's massive, 600-pound payload. Um, a lot of a lot of people want this this. Uh, capability. Um, in fact, the FAA, I think, wants this uh, kind of first because it's cargo lower risk than, you know, some of the other eVTOL platforms that we've been discussing. But for the most part, it's still a big airplane. So there's some inherent risks that come with it, right, as, a, as an auto automated uh, vehicle. And then, of course, the Nexus eVTOL, which currently has uh, an in-service date of 2030, I think we're we're being a little bit more pragmatic than that, and we'd probably say 2030 to 30, 2032, um, just because of we what we know about the system, the batteries, the the motors. Um, this vehicle is currently being built as well right now, uh, with a program uh, milestone of 2024 into 2024 for its first flight. Uh, the difference uh, with this and and maybe some of the other uh, folks that are out there is that. We've taken the rigor of certification into consideration up front, um, and we're building this demonstrator to be production representative. Um, and so that when we flip this to go to an actual production vehicle, there's not much change other than things we find out in testing. Uh, we feel like we have a pretty robust design here. And so that where other folks may be ahead of us for the last few years, we feel we can catch up just because of our ability to scale with manufacturing and some of the other processes that we've done in the past with our other aircraft. So um, 
a, a big bow wave in front of us, of course, but you know, I think uh, we can ride that to success. Uh, one of the things that we look at is uh, whether it's feasible, economically viable. And so we'll talk about some of those use cases because we designed the Nexus up front to be a multi-purpose vehicle, not just an air taxi. Um, right now we're looking at about a hundred nautical mile range, cruise speed of 120 knots. And it's fully electric. So one of the things I would just say is I go back to our, my initial message is that we intended all along to have a family of systems that start with an electric LSA for that exposure to the, to the technology and then grow individuals or companies along the way into the EV tall, uh, this EV tall segment. We're learning from these technologies as we go to and it becomes a, what we call a force multiplier, if you will. So with that, um, let's talk about the new a little bit more in depth, unless somebody has questions, please, if you have questions, just jump right in. Um, we look at a multi-purpose use case for the NUVA from ship to ship to ship to shore. So you can see there, there's an oil well. We've had a lot of interest in that, driving uh, anything from tools to supplies to food from shore to, to uh, oil wells offshore. And ship to ship, that's more of a government thing going from a large aircraft uh, base ship to something that's actually a little bit smaller. It has a helipad on the back to do resupply or to transition goods back and forth. One of the things I thought was an interesting use case, uh, the Massachusetts DOT just reached out to us and asked if there was a potentially used in NUVA uh, going from uh, on land to offshore to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And because the, I guess, ferry system there breaks down a lot or is stalled or you know, overtaxed, um, they figured that they could use this to move some goods on and offshore, and especially in uh, inclement weather, not total inclement weather, of course, but you know where they may have some challenges with the ferries. So there's an opportunity there. Uh, the biggest focus, of course, for us is medium and long range commercial cargo uh, segment. So anywhere from medical logistics with people like maybe a Novon Health to traditional carriers like FedEx, UPS, DHL, and then public aircraft operations. And when we get into public aircraft operations, we talk about disaster response. So think about you know, earthquakes in Haiti or hurricanes in Cuba, where we can actually use this vehicle to, to get to areas where most people can't and where helicopters just really don't have the capacity to be honest with you. Oh, sorry. And the next is the, the air taxi. I, I mentioned it was a multi-purpose vehicle. Um, we have three intended uses up front for us. It's air ambulance, number one. So when you look at our vehicle and the design, the configuration inside, yes, there's four passengers uh, and a pilot, uh, but those seats can come out and actually have a medical bench sit in those same uh, fixtures on the, on the ground or on the floor to uh, transport pa uh, patients, if you, if you will. Um, the next thing is cargo. Same thing, pull the seats out and you actually have, you know, about 600 to 800 pound payload in there um, that you can transfer goods when the vehicle is not being used for air taxi purposes. So we did this with the thought that maybe the demand single for air taxi is not going to be as great or if there's multiple players. So why not target multiple markets with the single vehicle? And the next thing is, of course, uh, public aircraft operations and disaster response. So, you know, search and rescue, those types of things that are pretty quick, pretty brief, where you've got, you know, you know, a range of 50 nautical miles per se, and you got to fly a couple of loops and then come back and land. Um, so with that, um, I will stop because I wanted to leave room for discussion or questions. Um, these are three links to our websites where you can actually see videos. I was going to play videos, but I didn't think it would work so well. And I'm glad I didn't because the technology challenge with the slide deck has already been kind of disturbing. <laughs> so I can stop sharing if you want and have a conversation, Johnny. All right. Hey, that's uh, always interesting to see how a company with a wealth of experience and able to pull the talent from different divisions and tackle this um, new combined challenges. You know, it, it, it's innovative platform system. It's not just one, uh, it's multifaceted uh, opportunities. <laughs> Let's use that word. So yeah, it's interesting. I always, uh, you know, I've been working with uh, Textron folks for, you know, both the rotorcraft and the fixed wing side for a long time. So I feel like I'm part of the family right there. It's, uh, it's you know, I always like the Textron folks. I mean, it, it's, uh, I, I know a lot of 
real talented people uh, in the company. So I'm delighted to see this kind of progress uh, uh, in, in, in development. So folks, feel free to uh, throw in questions, comments. I know Serge has a question. Come on, Serge. <laughs> oh yeah, Serge, you always do, right? Come on. <laughs> I'll ask a question you probably don't want to answer. What's the price target for the Nexa? Um, you're right. We're we're probably not going to answer that because you know the cost of certification kind of grows the the product. But you know, I would say it's going to be in line with the rest of Textron's. You know, jet products are actually less than that. Um, you know, we're not talking seventeen to twenty million here. We're talking. You know, we we want something underneath ten. To be honest with you. Okay. So that that seems to be fairly comparable with uh, the competition, primarily yeah. being Joby. They're probably going to come in right around ten million. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that uh, we have been trying to do is not not saying that anybody's seen anything you know challenging, but we have a pedigree that we have to keep in mind. And so when we go out, we want to make sure that we're making reasonable statements not only about the aircraft, but about the ecosystem that's gonna support these aircraft, as well as the challenges that are in front of us from an airspace perspective, you know, overall. And so uh, we, we take that into consideration. Great, thank you. Okay, if I don't ask, then people wonder. Um, <laughs> so I've seen Tony that you started to do the test, the wind tunnel testing um, yes. for the configuration you showed us. Um, you guys still planning and on schedule to uh, planning to to produce a prototype in 24 and starting doing some real life learning yes at, at Serge, we're building it right now then the nexus is that what you're talking about yes sir y yes so um we we are building the prototype right now um parts are coming in um in fact we don't have room for them on our floor right now so <laughs> Uh, but yes, the thought is that the end of 2024, um, more, more than likely November of that year, uh, we will be flying the Nexus. Um, right now we're targeting Choctaw Nation, um, and the test range out there. And so uh, we, we've kind of been working with those folks for a little bit about two years now, I think. So, and I would say the wind tunnel test. I don't know if you read about that um, or if it was in the press release, but there at Ruag, uh, we were the first uh, eVTOL to actually use a powered wind tunnel test. In other words, they had attached the hydraulics and the motors turned and everything else. So I think we learned quite a bit about our design and we were really kind of surprised about some of the things that we thought were going to be a challenge weren't. Um, so we we're pretty impressed with the amount of work they did over the six to eight week period that they were there. Thank you, Tony. Yep, you bet, Serge. Uh, uh, Danny. Hi, I was I was curious. Um, I'm, I'm presuming once with the with the the air taxi uh, version of your product that you'll be selling it as a vendor as opposed to actually also operating it as a service. And that's correct for the air taxi. We don't have uh, intent right now to be an operator like some of our competitors. However, the Nuba V300, um, there are opportunities there to partner with some folks that, you know, look, Textron, you know who we're partnered with and from a cargo perspective to be part of a uh, 135 operator until those designs get um, fully learned by our, by our uh, customers. You know, it's going to take a while to get them up and running, but they're going to want to use the product in a fashion. So we are thinking about, you know, doing operations with the Nuba to be honest with you. Great, thanks. Yeah. Alex, you wanna go next? Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. Very interesting uh, uh, to see that your real progress. So I just have a question. When you tell uh, people about uh, full electric, it means, it means just the batteries, right? So, or hybrid scheme. So my question is, my question is are you considering right now any hydrogen propulsion system options uh, for your aircrafts? No, of course, I'm from zero area, right? So, <laughs> so this is a logical question. <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. Yes. Um, so not only 
is e aviation considering it um we're working with textron aviation who's looking at it as well and there's some initiatives in the eu that we may be trying to work with i won't say what vehicle from textron uh, right now but yes we are looking at hydrogen and we would probably carry that technology over to something like the nexus or the nuva probably nuva first and then the nexus um if we're successful with that okay. there's there's a lot of challenges with hydrogen though yeah, of course. So I understand. So, and moreover, between Zero and Textron, we have a partnership, right? So yep. we're working for fixed wing. Yep. And it's a big black, uh, uh, <laughs> black spot in Evitol space. So that is why I'm I'm responsible for uh, Evitol market development. So if you have any interest, so just reach me out uh, through the community. I will be happy to help you. Well, you know what? I'm writing it down now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No more questions. Oh, from you bet. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, well, I guess a related question from Val. Uh, Val, are you online? You want to ask a question yourself? Well, Val ask, uh, um, it's interesting, which combustion engine do you use for generating electricity uh, if it's not a secret? Um, does that I read on the question, does that imply that uh, talking about a hybrid power system or something? So I'm reading between uh, what Val says in the uh, comma in the no section. So but you're probably talking about the not, Nuva, not, which not is a hybrid. running a hybrid power system or uh, are you, is that part of the plan? Yeah, so the Nuva is uh, currently a hybrid. It uses a Rotax motor on the back with a generator to resupply the batteries okay. from the vertical piece. Um, the thought is, is that we have yeah, customer range, part. I guess you, <laughs> you need that. Yeah, yeah. so we, we already have some additional customer requirements uh, since we've been socializing the platform that, you know, to go offshore, especially on ships, there's not a lot of Avgas or, you know, MoGas out there. So uh, heavy fuel engine is probably yeah. one of the things one, we get more power, we get longer range as well. So we've already been working with our internal company like Homing about an HFE to go on the back of the Nuva. Um, I would also say this, that it's not out of the question because the evolution of battery technology and how, you know, how slow that might be, where we might think about making the Nexus a hybrid platform as well. Um, so that's not out of the question. You know, right now, 100 nautical miles range is not going to get people what they, where they want to go when they want to go. So, and you look at the use case of just air taxi alone, it's not economically viable for us. So mm -hmm. we would actually look at it investing in a hybrid uh, platform to increase that use case and, you know, the actual viability of uh, economics within Textron. Makes sense. Uh, Thomas, you wanna go? Sure. <clears throat> so, hey, Tony, thanks for your presentation. Yeah. Um, always exciting to see a big company like Textron uh, get involved into this space. Um, as a pilot, though, I'm just curious, is there going to be anything coming on the horizon that, for the GA pilots? You know, something to replace like the 172 or something like that. So so I don't know if you saw in the beginning, but the Velus Electro, um, they're right now, while that's an LSA and it's a 50 minute endurance, um, that's initial pilot training, right? Circuit work, takeoff and landing. The Panthera, we would actually be doing, you know, an electric version of that as well. Probably about half the range of what it gets now. Um, I can't really say what it's going to be called, but there is something that's comparable to a 182T um, that uh, we are working in the background. I would just say this, Pipistrel has about 17 products, either in design or manufactured that we didn't discuss today. And it, it, there's there's something for everyone there, right? So yes, to answer your question, we do have something that's fully electric that would probably meet that that uh, niche um, to do cross country flights, but not you know super long range like 500 nautical miles. Yeah, the 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 closest thing what I was thinking of was like the the Air One. I don't know if you're familiar with that out of mm -hmm. Israel. Uh, it's vertical takeoff and land because you know getting away from airports and being yeah, able to yeah. live in the backyard seems like a and a, a serious advancement for the GA pilot and having all the automation, uh, we could reduce the complexity and the, the training requirements and get more people into aviation and thinking about taking buying an airplane and taking that to travel uh, instead of getting in the car, you know? 
right? And so some of the things that we have to be careful of is the balance of taking away the freedom of aviation from people because there's the traditional list that like, I get in my airplane because I want to do the flying and I want the airplane to fly me, <laughs> you know? So we have to have that delicate balance of how much automation and how much ease do we put in there? And is it just somebody going along for the ride or is it, we still maintain that excitement and that thrillness that's associated with flying an airplane for the first couple of times, right? So I hear you. Um, there, there are opportunities all over the place, but as you know, Textron's focused on, you know, trying not to kill its current piston business segment with the in introduction of new, you know, technology like, you know, an electric aircraft. So we have to have a delicate balance there. So we're kind of hitting in between all the lines of all the products that already exist, but noted in, yeah, I would say that there's stuff there that's in work. <laughs> well, I guess the way I was looking at it is, you know, we have a very small pilot po population yep. and a huge potential aviation consumer owner population that yep. doesn't want to go to the trouble of getting, you know, the time and effort and expense to become a private pilot. If they can buy an aircraft that's you know, automates a lot of the complexity, you know, you can think of flying as a skill, like you go bowling or hunting, whatever, mm -hmm. we can think of, of flying as an alternative to taking a road trip. It seems to me like there'd be a, a really big market for, you know, someone who doesn't want to like take that time, but still wants the convenience of being able to take off and land from the backyard and fly to grandma's house in her backyard. You know, I mean, that would be a pretty game changing experience and you don't have to deal with, and I'm in Southern California, so the traffic is a nightmare whenever you want to go somewhere. If you could go by air, I mean, it seems like it's a whole new market to tap. It, it is. And one of the challenges, I, I, there was a summit in DC last week that Sergio, Sergio was at. And one of the things, you know, there's this disparity between the thoughts of what the qualifications are for a pilot from, you know, normal aircraft to EV tall to electric airplanes. And I would say that the more we introduce things like this, the harder it becomes to, you know, have the conversation with regulators on about what is airmanship at that point, and are they really aircraft at that point? And you know, they're still in the NAS, so we got to still teach people aeronautical decision making, whether or not they have a hold of the controls or not, right? So, um, I, I I see a use for it, and yes, there's a huge potential there. But right now, I think it's it's hard enough just to get the regulator to discuss, you know, what we've got in front of us. So I, I see a challenge there, but you know, it's not a huge challenge, right? We just have to redefine, you know, what what qualifications are for folks. It's the same thing with maintenance. Yeah. Well, I, I'm coming from the clean transportation point of point of things. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to electrify all the, you know, trucks, cars, whatever in California, you can't even buy a a gas and a diesel car yeah. five. but you know the problem with surface transportation is it doesn't really solve the the congestion problem and from oh. a pollution standpoint which i think is something that all the proponents of sustainable aviation to be talking about is the fact that particularly a vertical takeoff and land aircraft they don't have uh, emissions of things like brake dust mm -hmm. and tire wear and those things are you know responsible for a significant amount of uh environmental pollution and that ends up in the rivers lakes and oceans so right. aviation is in my mind is really what we should be thinking about is the most sustainable form of transportation what is the uh, what are you what are you doing on sunday thomas <laughs> I, I didn't and, make andrew andrew is leading a group uh out in wisconsin we're going to talk about that topic very specifically um i'm with zivaero.com and we are developing a solution that you're looking for it's the ev tall for the rest of us so yeah, perfect. yeah come and join us it's the uh the meeting is the uh uh electric aircraft society that's uh holding the the meeting i would love to learn more about it if you can post something in the chat that'd be great um, it's it's the Vertical Flight Society and um, Electric Aircraft Symposium, and oh, okay. you can you can attend uh, in person in uh, Oshkosh or uh, virtually as well if you're not going to okay. be there. Perfect. Yeah, registration is still open. We yeah. actually uh, yeah. we're going to add another room because we have so many yeah, don't, folks don't interested. There. I mean, you got to be there to <laughs> crazy enough uh, to 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 be among all the crazy folks uh, we have over there. 
Um, well, Sergio, you got uh, the look like you have. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew. Yeah. You, you you were uh, going to say something else, I guess. Go I, ahead, Andrew. I was, and I did jump in late. So apologies if we already talked about this. But did we touch on the proposed mosaic uh, updates that were released yesterday, and and how that's going to affect um, uh, the release of of your awesome aircraft in the United States? Because I would like to buy three. S you talking about the Velus Electro? Yes. So here's the here's the interesting thing about this, uh, Andrew. Um, I have a petition for exemption in for that to 21190, and the FAA has been working with me diligently behind the scenes. Uh, I don't know if it was in anticipation for Mosaic or not, but regardless, um, you know, I, I think Mosaic is going to be a little bit further along after the comment period and they adjudicate all those comments. So I'm looking probably anywhere up to maybe even six months from now before that rule is final. So we're yeah. probably going to get an exemption sooner than that. Do you and need an exemption? They're, they're, they proposed uh, yeah. removing the requirement for a single reciprocating engine. Yeah. And it's as many engines as, as, as we want and, and as much weight as we want, which is awesome. It's just a proposal right now, though. It's not a final rule. That's the problem. Got it. So Got the, it. the great thing about them releasing Mosaic, though, uh, was the fact that because my petition's in, now it's kind of boxed them in. If they deny the petition, now they can't, they can't point back to the mosaic or say, well, hey, we got to take that out of the rule now because we already had it in there, right? So um, the thought right. is, is that once the rule is final, then I won't need the, the exemptions and the 8030-15s anymore in each of the vehicles we sell in the US, so. Well, I'm thrilled and uh, I, I'm, it seems just uh, perfect for what you're trying to do and perfect for the rest of us that have been wanting to buy one for years. And I will say this next week, we've already got a buzz going about it now because we're going to have the entire Pipistrol team there next week in Oshkosh, as well as Rob and myself. We're trying to figure out how we're going to take all the orders. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You'll probably down for one. <laughs> yeah. We got, to sell. we got plenty to sell. We got plenty to sell. There you go. Uh, all right, Sergio, you got another thought. Come on. I do. Uh, so, by the way, I've flown the, the, the Pipistrol. Uh, aircraft and it's awesome and I don't even have a pilot license uh, <laughs> but I had a, it was an instructor flying with me so uh, um, question um, uh, Tony the 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 majority of the order book for the Nuva 300 is with SF Express um, any any concerns there considering the animosity between our countries and the amount of work you guys do in the military so um, let me see if I can explain this in a way that seems cognizant. Um, it's only for one aircraft. Um, and the the biggest challenge with that was the flight control system. And it's being done by a third party vendor out of Germany. Um, mm -hmm. Everything else from the NUVA perspective, the reservations that we've taken on the production models now. And in fact, that vehicle is not even a production model, uh, not asserted one. Um, we are using, you know, our partner as it's public information Honeywell for the flight control system, the FCC. So, um, yeah, that we've kind of separated from that. That occurred before the acquisition. So we couldn't just like rip the bandaid off and get rid of it. So it's it's for the one aircraft though. And I think they're gonna be flying mushrooms out of the mountains or something. When there's these high value mushrooms up there on the top of the mountains when I get them down pretty quick because they, they rot or something. So, hey, go for it. <laughs> Got it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Hey, Tony, I have another question. You, you talk about the... Um uh you, you you're bringing the supplier in as a part of the team and all that yeah. uh, i'm 100 percent uh in favor of that uh approach the my curiosity is that uh on your recent electric aircraft development or ev development are you seeing high percentage to be the traditional aviation supplier or are you seeing a lot of new player outside of traditional aviation supply that uh, that jump in right now I, I, Johnny, I would say it's 50-50. There's a balance between the two. Okay. Um, I would say some of the traditionals haven't um, evolved, if you will, and embraced new technology, which is required for, you know, these new types of composites, new types of electrical systems. You know, we're talking high voltage electrical systems at 800 volts. And, you know, most people don't deal with that unless you're in metro, like buses or trains. So um, I would say there's a delicate balance between two. But I would say this, that most of the ones that we're looking at for fasteners or, or whatnot, um, they have an aviation pedigree as well. So we're not so we're not straying too far away from the 
the known zone, if you call it, <laughs> as you will. Yeah, you need you need the the uh, yeah maybe the legacy is not the right word, but uh, yeah. pr well proven, well engaged uh, supplier, but add some new ones because you need a few uh, new technology, uh, new methodology, and new elements and so on. That uh, uh, now it, it's going to be interesting. Uh, probably not right now to answer, but the the software certification is going to be an interesting topic. Well, it's funny you mentioned certification. So one of everything that we do, we take that that word into mind uh, on every approach that we have, whether it's flight controls, landing gear, you name it, composites. And you know, nobody's certified more airplanes in the world than Textron. You know, between Cessna Hawker and Beechcraft and Bell. So the fact of the matter is, we're leveraging that and that understanding and knowing that you know, just materials qualification issue papers alone for for new materials. You know, how long does it take to, to navigate that process? So we're, we're really being reserved in, in our approach. And when, when we say a date, you know, it's like, okay, this is the best we can do knowing what our history is, you know, with the regulator and the certification. You know, we did Sky Courier in three and a half years and some of that was pre-qualified materials, right? So that was the fastest and that was part 23, amendment 64. So, I, I mean, there, there's some bold, bold approaches out there and I give it to them and I hope they're successful, but, you know, we just, you know, we got to take the, the safety and custodianship of the national airspace into mind everything we do, right? Yeah, there's a tremendous value in that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, any other questions, suggestions, comments? Uh, oh, JP, go ahead. Hey, Johnny, thank you. So I actually posted on the chat room, uh, but I recently saw the news that Technam announced that they are postponing the P Volt project due to low net present value caused by the battery degradation and the uh, needs for frequent battery replacement cost. So that was being cited as the challenge. Now I gave a talk at this event a few months ago when I was representing Mobius Energy, the battery company. So this is a topic that's very dear to my heart. Uh, now I'm independent, but still. So PPSL is the only company that actually have the experience of supporting the customers with the battery replacement. And I'd like to learn your perspective on this challenge and how you have overcome and what do you think is the implication for the operators of electric aircraft in the future, in the near future? So you assume we overcame it, right? Just because- Well, I did not assume, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, um, fair enough. Look, I, I, th I think, you know, that was, that was one of the, you know, genius behind the acquisition is that the advancements that they had made in in, in batteries um, was evident. Now they're not without challenges, and the ability to scale is pretty hard, um, especially when we start ordering you know in order of magnitude these Velos Electros per se. If, if if we sold a hundred of them next week at Oshkosh, it's like you just you just really put a huge roadblock in the in the production line. And how do we overcome that? You can hire more people, you get more equipment, but you still have to have access to the cells, right? And cell technology. And so we are beholden to every, like everybody else, to a certain couple of manufacturers on, on cell chemistry, right? And cell technology. So until we are not going to dabble in that, right? We're not going to actually create cell chemistry and do our own stuff. We we acquire it like everybody else, but we've come into a, a place where we're we done it enough now with the smaller airplanes that they can do it pretty quickly and there's a process in, in machining for that and as far as support goes um, you know we're at a, a position where we hope that the batteries we're just now getting data back on some of the very first uh, Velas is sold right yes we do a recommended battery change but we're finding out that that lifespan is much longer than we anticipated don't know if that's because of the way the vehicles are being used or if, you know, it's just, you know, they're that robust and that's, you know, and I'm not an engineer, so, you know, I can't really tell you, and that'd be a TNA, you know, Tomasich uh, question to be honest with you, and everybody probably knows TNA. So um, we are going to support the customer with our product no differently than we did with the very first, you know, 172, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's going forward. The genius behind the acquisition on the Tektron side, though, is our ability to manufacture and scale. So what I would say, without giving away trade sauce, um, is that you will see a coalescing of that battery technology maybe here in Wichita at some point to where we can actually scale that appropriately 
we're still beholden to, you know, some manufacturers though, right? So I don't know if that, that helps or answers your question. We still have the same challenges everybody else does when it comes to batteries though. I would, you know, I, I would just add to that. I think that's a great answer, Tony. I think that it, it's so much uh, dependent on what the con ops are. I mean, yeah. you know, if, if you've got an air taxi and you're just, you're just hammering the battery, you know, every half hour, of course you have a, an issue with battery life, yeah. right? But if you're, if, you're pl- if you're flying out in the bush using it for search and rescue or whatever like that, it's not an issue. So I think that, you know, I, I think the cool thing that is that we've learned a tremendous amount of battery life uh, in the, uh, you know, the automobile industry and, and seeing what Tesla's done and, you know, limiting the, the charge discharge depths, it, it has a, a huge impact on the, on the battery lifetime. So, you know, it's, it's so much of it is just mission dependent. And that's all I wanted to contribute to that. So. Well, and, you know, so I would just like, like Ultium battery, right? for the hummer it's ten thousand pounds and as you know in aircraft weight is a premium and so we get caught in this do loop like everybody else that you increase battery weight you increase performance requirements and then you're back to square one so you know it's one of those things you can only put so much battery in an airplane (laughs) and you have and so that's why we say we got a hundred nautical mile range right now if that you know so until cell chemistry improves you know yeah, yeah, I think Stefan is absolutely right. It all depends on the corners. So I was wondering, you know, your two-seat valise was originally intended to be used for either GA, but also for the flight schools, yeah, for the pilot yeah. training. Yeah. So it's not as intense as air taxi application, right. but I would assume that you're still flying it quite a bit. Now, when I talked to Rob about this a uh, couple of months ago, he told me the recommendation is that you recommend your customers to replace the battery when it comes down to 90% of the original yes. capacity. Yes. But now you are saying that you are seeing the customers using it much longer period. Right. And and so that's interesting. Yeah. It's taking longer to get to that though, that 90%. Okay. Right. And that yeah, 90% good. threshold is basically a safety barrier because you know mm-hmm. we don't know what we all know that once a, a battery gets below a certain state of charge, it it drops exponentially, right? So we don't want that to happen in mid-flight to somebody. So we're doing a precautionary and, and saying this is where we want to change things out. We just went to Gen 2 batteries on all the Velus Electros and, and swapped those out for folks. We're already on Gen 3, which is going to give us you know, a, a, a considerable amount more range than what we already currently have. So it's exciting. One of, yeah. one of the issues uh, with the um, capacity of the battery pack is that the battery management system um, is designed to deal with the weakest yep. cell in the pack. And there is some advanced battery management system technology that solves that issue and greatly extends the uh, capability of the uh, battery output and life. And cell isolation, yeah. yeah. And I can tell you as a Tesla driver, I've lost 10% of my capacity after 100,000 miles. And looking at all the, you know, other Teslas have gone two, three, 400,000 miles. It, it doesn't, you know, it just gradually drops off. It kind of drops off a bit in the first maybe 50 or 40, 50,000 miles. And then it's really slow, but it, it seems to be like perpetually a very slow degradation over time. I don't see any drop-offs in the data for the Tesla batteries at all. No yeah. sudden drops. It's just like a steady, flat, slow degradation. Yeah, and, and Les, again, I'm not the uh, engineer or the battery uh, specialist, but what they've seen in their test data there over various amounts of tests is that there is a sharp decline at a certain point uh, where it hits a certain state of charge and then, you know, it's not even, you, know, you need to get rid of the battery, you know. I guess if you see for aircraft use, if you see that potential, uh, yeah. we all, as aircraft engineer, we all tend to uh, rather take the conservative approach, at least to start with, until proven otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah better but, be cautious. <laughs> the, uh, Tesla in solving a... Uh, DMS technology advances, I think the whole industry will continue to evolve and enhance the capabilities and usefulness uh, 
but I guess we may have to start off with a little more conservative approach. <laughs> to be well, honest, uh, Tesla in uh, responding to a lawsuit uh, or, or got sued because uh, to to mitigate some of the fires and other issues in their battery system, they did a software update hmm. um, some time ago that uh, reduced the range of the vehicles below hmm. what they advertised. Hmm. And why that reduced the range is because they they didn't charge as full and they didn't discharge as much as in the original pack. And again, that's back to the problem of uh, uh, dealing with the weakest cell within the pack. Yep. Which I have a client that solved that problem, by the way. Huh. That's so good to know. I, um, I, I posted that in the chat. So if somebody wants to well, contact I, me, I, yeah. I, I know they, power conditioning. That, I'll tell you guys, folks, uh, I think we, we, <laughs> we can probably stay here for a long, long time. There's <laughs> a lot of topics we want to talk about. Uh, however, we already passed our scheduled uh, uh, the slot time slot by seven minutes. Uh, you know, I, I just want to say, I mean, let, let, we will continue to engage and discuss. Uh, that's what the working group is about. You know, the, the great, great ideas, different development. Let's all engage. Let's uh, benefit from everybody's experience and knowledge. Um, and Tony, thank you so much. Yeah. This is um, such an interesting topic. Uh, and we are looking forward to more progress and announcements uh, made by uh, Textron uh, uh, E-Aviation. Uh, and finally, uh, again, um, thanks uh, for Dr. Marlena Pavel to be the new coach uh, lead and uh, looking forward to a lot of interesting activities and progress. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, everybody. And thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, bye everybody.